chapter thirteen a fuel of fire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fuel of fire by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter thirteen the losing of the keys like bluebeard's wife i lost the key thenceforth it was not well with me i say nora said nancy to her sister one afternoon a day or two after the foregoing conversation have you seen my keys tumbling about anywhere your keys no have you lost them i must have done so but goodness knows where replied nancy unconscious of the obviousness of her reply since if goodness did know where the said keys were secreted they could hardly be described as lost which keys are they oh there is the key of my jewel-case and the key of my cash-box and the key of the box where all my old love-letters are kept and and one or two others with the strange and sudden reserve which now and again attacks outspoken people nancy did not mention that the other two keys on the lost bunch were those of the front door and the library at baxendale hall there is no secret so well kept as the secret which is guarded by the occasional reserve of habitually unreserved natures if a man is naturally secretive we expect him to keep back something and allow for the fact but it never occurs to us that the usually outspoken are capable of keeping back anything and so we conclude that the thing which they do not tell us does not exist hence the unreserved have powers of concealment which are denied to the naturally silent how inconvenient exclaimed nora it is most frightfully inconvenient and it isn't a bit my own fault because i distinctly remember taking them out of the pocket of my dirty muslin frock and putting them into the pocket of my clean one i suppose one's pocket isn't really a very safe place for things yes it is the safest place in the world because the things are always in one's own keeping don't you see and other people can't get at them perhaps there was a hole in your pocket nan well if there was it wasn't my fault it was pearson's pearson was the miss burton's maid if a maid can't mend a hole in one's pocket what is the good of having a maid at all or perhaps you pull them out with your pocket handkerchief nora suggested further well if i did that wasn't my fault either what is the use of a pocket handkerchief that you never take out of your pocket it would be worse than a chain bible or a captive balloon never mind nan i can lend you my pearl beads till your jewel case is opened again or anything else that you need nora was a very good sister oh the jewel case doesn't matter because it doesn't happen to be locked then if it is the cash-box i can lend you as much money as you want till the keys are found again that doesn't matter either because i've spent all this quarter's allowance already and the cash-box is empty then if it is only the old love-letters i can lend you plenty of them too heaps upon heaps and they're all pretty much the same whoever they happen to be addressed to so one set is as good as another good gracious it isn't the love-letters that matter because the lock of that box is broken so that anybody can get at them and as well without the key as with it then why bother about the keys at all asked sensible nora i wasn't bothering about them replied nancy hastily only it is stupid to lose things never mind they are bound to turn up our things always do and with that scanty comfort nancy had to be content and the conversation drifted into its wonted channel namely the baxendale catastrophe i wonder how lawrence will bear all these horrid suspicions about him remarked nora thoughtfully he's just the sort of person to take them to heart i know he is that's just the bother how do you mean oh i mean that's just the the bother don't you know as shown in the matter of the keys a reserve contrary to her nature seized miss burton when discussing anything connected with mr baxendale until now she had been the most transparent person possible only too glad to retail her innermost thoughts and feelings 
to any one who had patience to listen to them but a new shyness born of her love for lawrence made her shrink from talking openly about her feelings toward him and a new loyalty to him and everything concerning him made her shrink from talking openly of his feelings toward her you mean that you think he'll die of a broken heart or anything thrilling of that kind persisted nora who liked to sift a matter to its dregs oh dear no but i'm afraid he'll mind awfully and that he won't laugh at it as we should if people said we'd done anything queer yes he's much more sensitive than we are and that's a pity it isn't a pity at all nancy fired up it only shows what tremendously fine material he is made of and how immensely superior he is to us he may be superior to us but he isn't superior to mr arbuthnot and mr arbuthnot says it is enervating to care as much for the censure of other people as lawrence baxendale cares mr arbuthnot should mind his own business and not interfere with things that don't concern him he doesn't interfere he told me he was longing to tell lawrence how much he sympathized with him and what a pity he thought it was that lawrence was taking the matter in the way he is taking it but that he didn't venture to do so for fear lawrence should think he was taking a liberty then he ought to have spoken to lawrence and shown his sympathy with him and advised him not to take idle gossip so much to heart it was his duty as a parish priest to do so and i think it has been a great neglect of duty on his part to leave poor lawrence so much to himself cried nancy with fine disregard of the penultimate remark but it is difficult not to leave people to themselves when they persist in keeping to themselves and you can't deny that lawrence baxendale is doing that he hasn't been near us since the hall was burned down and he used to drop in nearly every day a woman will always endeavour to prove a satisfactory alibi on the part of a man who has not been to see her as often as she thinks and would rather die than own she thinks he ought and the more clearly she sees that he could come if he had wished to do so the more conclusively does she demonstrate that his advent would have entailed a suspicion of all the laws of nature wherefore nancy quickly replied he couldn't possibly have come he's been much too busy putting his own fire out and consuming his own smoke to pay calls he's had no end of things to do since the hall was burned down i dare say he has but all the same he might have looked in just for five minutes if only to tell us that he hadn't time to do so however busy a person is he has always time to write and say that he hasn't time to write at least that has been my experience and the principle is the same with calls as with letters how silly you are norrie has been up at the hall every day looking after things i know that but he might have come here before he went on or after he came back so that we might have told him how sorry we are for him but that is just what lawrence would hate to see that people were sorry for him that's what i call so standoffish and unneighbourly i always like people to be sorry for me even if they've no cause to be i love to be pitied it makes people so fond of one and i hate to be pitied there's the difference between you and me my dear nora i adore admiration and i hate pity whatever i had to suffer i couldn't bear anybody to be sorry for me except nobody nancy stopped just in time nora gazed thoughtfully at her sister you and mr baxendale aren't really so very different after all i believe you are as proud underneath your outspokenness as he is underneath his stiffness and you would hate to be pitied every bit as much as he does yes i should i should and that's why i understand the reason of his not wanting to come and see us explained nancy forgetting that she had just proved that there was no such reason nor any need for one he feels that we should pity him and that we should show it and that's just what he couldn't stand well i can't grasp the idea do you mean to say nan that if you were unhappy it wouldn't comfort you to know that other people were sorry good gracious no it would make everything a thousand times worse i wish people to envy me i don't even mind their disliking me and i enjoy their disapproving of me but all the time i insist on their regarding me as a brilliant young woman and admiring me even while they detest well you are funny i'm not made a bit like that i am and it's a very good make too do you mean to say you would rather be admired than loved asked nora much rather admiration without love i delight in but love without admiration would make me positively ill i expect that is why you and lawrence get on so well together you are both proud though in such different ways 
yes we are alike in some things but not in others i only wish we were you mean you wish he was more like us oh dear no i wish i was more like him nora was silent for a moment then she said you admire him very much don't you nancy i should just think i do more than any one else i ever saw or ever dreamed of nancy's reserve was beginning to thaw in the warm atmosphere of sisterly communion i wonder if you admire him as much as i admire michael arbuthnot nancy laughed the laugh of the scornful i should rather think so there's so much more in him to admire but her sister was not going to stand that oh no there isn't in the first place he is a layman and in the second he hasn't half as much to say for himself nobody could admire him as much as the vicar well i can and do nancy could be obstinate when occasion demanded it nora's pretty forehead was wrinkled with thought do you feel that you thoroughly understand lawrence baxendale she asked i often wonder if you do nancy paused for a second before replying yes and no she said slowly oh how very interesting do explain man i always know what he will do in any given circumstance but i don't always know why he will do it just as i always know when i have heard him but hardly ever how i have heard him clever little nora nodded i see you know exactly where he will get to but you don't know by what road yes that's it for instance i understand that because he is hurt and sore he will not come near to any of us for fear we should pity him but why the idle gossip of the people about here should make him so sore and hurt him so much i haven't the ghost of an idea if i knew i hadn't done a thing i shouldn't care who said i had in fact i don't think i should care much for that even if i had done it he evidently is awfully cut up about it or else he wouldn't shut himself up in the way he is doing yes and i'll tell you more exclaimed nancy in a sudden burst of sisterly confidence i knew he'd go like this the minute i heard what nonsense people were talking though why he should take it so hard i can't conceive and it's such a mistake because his father says it makes people think that their suspicions against him are correct nancy wrung her hands i know i know that is where he is such a good noble stupid darling he has no idea of taking the course most advantageous to himself it is a pity sighed pretty nora with a not altogether unbearable sorrow which even the best of women feel over the follies of a brother-in-law either in essa or in posse heaps of men would have turned this misfortune to their own account and made quite a piece of good luck out of it do you think i don't know that and poor nancy fairly groaned but your dear lawrence never will now if only he'd manage things the right way continued nora the whole affair would turn out for his good he would be saved for the future from paying that tiresome insurance money and would pocket a fortune of a hundred thousand pounds into the bargain but some people have a knack of taking occasion by the hand and others haven't that's true king canute for instance was built after the baxendale pattern when he rebuked his courtiers for saying that he could rule the waves a la britannia and then had his throne put where he knew the sea would wash over him after he had specifically forbidden it to do so yes that's exactly what lawrence would have done now had i been in canute's place nancy went on i should have placed my throne just half a yard above high-water mark and i should have ordered the sea not to touch my feet and of course it wouldn't then i should have turned to my courtiers and said see how right you were nora laughed but they wouldn't have believed either you or themselves they'd have seen through your little dodge and have known that the sea didn't obey you really of course they would but they'd have winked behind my back to one another and said she knows a thing or two does mrs canute now it seems to me that great men are like canute they show to the world how small a thing is their own greatness compared with the greatness of abstract truth but clever men are like me they adopt the greatness of abstract truth to increase their own greatness and the world isn't always quite sure where the one ends and the other begins i wonder which feels the nicer to be great or clever it depends on the sort of things that you enjoy most if you want your biography to read on sunday afternoons by the next generation but one be great but if you want a peerage and westminster abbey be clever but i don't want either as it happens nora explained then if you don't know what you want what's the use of asking me how to get it silly i do know what i want though oh if you only want a sweetheart 
for youth and a husband for middle age and a widower to plant forget-me-nots on your grave which is all that most women want you needn't trouble to be either great or clever it will be quite enough if you do your hair nicely and wear your best clothes when there's an off chance of seeing him laughed nancy nora nodded her head with satisfaction oh nancy how wise you are about always wearing one's best clothes i mean but all the same it comes expensive it does i know that from experience i don't mind telling you as a secret that the return of the baxendales from drawbridge castle has taken three months off the average life of a new hat as far as i am concerned i know and yet it doesn't do to go out in an old one when there's a chance of meeting anybody and nora looked very serious of course it doesn't why my dear i once heard a dreadful tale and it was quite true too of a man who was very sweet on a girl and was just going to propose to her but he happened to meet her at a party where she wore her last year's hat and she looked so dowdy that it fairly choked him off then do you think men always like us less when we don't look nice nancy i think they always like us better when we do which comes pretty much to the same thing and why strain their affection poor dears to the breaking point they are bound to love and cherish us in sickness and poverty and all sorts of similar unpleasantnesses but there is no absolute necessity for them to love and cherish us in shabby hats and i should never worry them for an extra such as that i see after all continued nancy love like a canal bridge ought not to be expected to carry more than the ordinary traffic of the district and i consider a last year's hat on a par with a traction engine greatly in excess of the ordinary traffic and to be feared accordingly yes nan you are right it doesn't do to strain even love too far there were a few minutes pause and then nancy suddenly asked apropos of nothing do you think that the end generally justifies the means when you want any particular thing mr arbuthnot says it doesn't still you see he is a clergyman and so would take stricter views of things than ordinary people would being a clergyman must make every day like sunday don't you think then you should say that being a clergyman's wife would make every day like sunday too nora's face was quite anxious as she put this question not quite more like saints days and harvest festivals and christmas neither one thing nor another but don't you think that with an ordinary man or woman the end would justify the means i really don't know do you think it would yes replied nancy seriously i do i think that if you want a thing with all your heart and are convinced that the thing will do you good and not harm if you get it you are justified in leaving no stone unturned in trying to get that particular thing but you wouldn't do anything that was actually wrong in trying to get it would you nan ah there's my difficulty it's so hard for me to know what is actually wrong and what isn't i'm sure that different people have different kinds of consciences just as they have different kinds of ears and eyes nora looked puzzled how do you mean i don't quite understand i mean that one man has a sensitive ear so that he can tell at once if a note is out of tune and another man hasn't and one man has a sensitive eye so that he can tell at once whether colours harmonise with each other or not and another man hasn't and one man has a sensitive conscience so that he can tell at once if a thing is wrong and another man hasn't then haven't you got a sensitive conscience nancy no i haven't i can't tell instinctively whether a thing is right or wrong as some people can if any one proved to my entire satisfaction that a thing was actually wrong i wouldn't do that thing for worlds but i have no power of finding out for myself whether things are right or wrong haven't you how funny well i can't help it if i'm made like that any more than a musical people or colour-blind people can help it nora looked doubtful i don't know i'm afraid it's rather wicked of you no it isn't it really isn't things that you can't help can't be wicked you might just as well say that it is wicked to be deaf or blind or lame it is better not to be i admit but there is no wickedness about the thing then do you mean to say nancy that your conscience never acts at all neither backward nor forward if it doesn't keep you from doing things doesn't it make you miserable after you've done them not of itself if other people prove to me that i ought not to have done something that i have done then of course i'm dreadfully sorry that i did it but i can't find out for myself that i oughtn't to have done it well remarked nora you can't say that you and lawrence are alike in this respect if you are in others for a more active conscience than his i never came across 
active it's more than active it's always in a state of eruption like vesuvius and i should think you find it very difficult to understand this part of his character i find it more than difficult replied nancy i find it utterly impossible one thing however i have learned from observation and experience and that is however incomprehensible a man may be it is always a mistake for a woman to try to translate him for the benefit of the audience she only makes matters worse her translation doesn't render him an atom easier to be understood but it has such an irritating effect on him that he makes himself more troublesome and obscure on purpose if a woman wants to study men she must do so in the original it is useless attempting to publish them in one's mother tongue men are like poetry aren't they if you attempt to translate them all the rhyme and most of the reason are lost in the process whatever brings you girls stuffed up in the house this lovely afternoon exclaimed anthony burton bursting into the room where the two sisters were sitting i'm going out almost at once replied nancy but i thought the longer i waited the cooler it would get i imagine that our beloved nora would be attending even song this afternoon remarked nora's cousin with a malicious twinkle in his eye but evidently i exaggerated that young woman's devotional tendencies i'm going to even song nora demurely replied i always go to on wednesdays and fridays but it isn't time to start yet she added looking at the clock it is only a quarter past four only a quarter past four about this clock anthony corrected her but other clocks tell a very different story nora started up from her seat aghast do you mean to say that this clock isn't right what a nuisance i was depending upon it and thought i had heaps of time now i shall have to hurry and get so disgustingly hot what is the right time tony and poor nora pinned on her hat and patted her fringe and looked for her gloves in a great hurry that depends upon what country you are referring to replied anthony cautiously nora stamped her foot impatiently don't be silly but tell me what time it is by your watch the same as by your clock fifty minutes past four but you said this clock was different from the others argued nancy with a frown so it is quite different from all the clocks in australia and america and africa and even on the other side of europe but i never said that it was different from the other clocks in this country because it isn't the two girls burst out laughing what a goose you are exclaimed nora you did give me a fright that my dear child was my intention well at any rate i shall start now she added so as to be in church by five o'clock as i don't want to hurry i'm going out too said nancy and the two girls left the room together and then went their several ways nora to church and nancy toward baxendale in search of her lost keys as the latter walked across the field and through the iron gate into the lane she looked at the ground in the hope of recovering her missing property but in vain not a sign of her keys could she see she had not been quite open with nora as to where she remembered seeing them last in that sudden reserve which attacks all women even the most loquacious when they first fall in love and realize that a stranger has stepped in between them and their own people nancy had never told her sister about lawrence's loan of the keys of baxendale and now she did not wish to mention the fact to anybody she was clever enough to know that in the present unpleasant state of affairs the less that was said about any one's having access to the hall the better she did remember putting the keys into the pocket of a clean new muslin dress the morning before the fire but she further remembered going up to baxendale hall that very day and using both the key of the front door and the key of the library but from that time she had no recollection of seeing the bunch of keys at all she had only just discovered her loss but now it had occurred to her that as she had no further use for the keys she had better return them to lawrence and on looking for them in order to give them back to him lo they were nowhere to be found she had been searching for them all morning in the house and garden of wayside and now she thought she would walk up to baxendale by her accustomed path and see if she could find them either on the way or there but though her eyes were busy peering in every possible spot for the missing keys her thoughts were filled with lawrence in accordance with her usual light-heartedness she resolutely put from her the thought that the burning of baxendale hall could be anything but a blessing ordained for the special purpose of putting her lover and herself in a position to marry nevertheless she could not quite banish the consciousness that hitherto the catastrophe instead of bringing her and lawrence together had served to drive them apart 
it was very strange she thought that lawrence did not come to her in his trouble as she would have gone to him had the trouble been hers but there was a certain ghastly familiarity in the strangeness a certain cruel conviction in the impossibility which men and women experience when they realize that the incredible has come to pass and that the unbearable has to be borne also there clutched at the heart of nancy the first pangs of that world-old agony which comes to all of us when we first understand that there are limitations to our gift of consolation toward those whom we love best that our power to love and our power to console are by no means synonymous it is when our best beloved are writhing from the effects of a wound which no touch of ours can heal or even soothe that we are brought face to face with the incapacities of human affection we would gladly give our very lives if this pain could be in any way diminished but it cannot our powerlessness is as complete as is our sympathy as we go through the world we love and are loved by many we cheer and are cheered by many we help and are helped by many but if in the whole course of a lifetime we find one human heart which we are able perfectly to heal and to comfort one human hand which is able perfectly to heal and comfort us we may of a truth consider ourselves blessed for this is the greatest and the rarest gift vouchsafed to the sons and daughters of men as nancy struggled against the conviction that lawrence had gone down into the shades of the prison-house and had shut the door in her face in spite of all her longing to follow him she suddenly raised her eyes and saw her beloved coming toward her along the grassy lane she had looked for him at the cross-roads and he was nowhere to be seen so she had gone on her way with that heart-sickness which is the invariable result of not finding the expected person at the accustomed place but now she met him at another point of the road on his way from baxendale to poplar farm not as she was quick to perceive on his way from poplar farm to wayside and the perception cut her like a knife End of chapter thirteen